three o'clock. Um, I wish you all very warmly welcome to the seventh Christel Stendhal Memorial Lecture. Uh, I'm Helena Engel from the Center for Interfaith Dialogue in the Diocese of Stockholm. And uh, we came up with the idea of honoring our former bishop, Christel Stendhal, who was uh, a great uh, promoter of interfaith dialogue. Um, I think it came from his work as a New Testament scholar when he discovered new things about the relations between Jews and Christians in the uh, Christian scriptures. Um, that also led to a wider engagement in interfaith dialogue. And he has uh, given us three rules for interfaith encounter, which those of you with good eyesight can see on the sides here, but I'll just read them through because that's the rules that we adhere to. Firstly, when you are trying to understand another religion, you should ask the adherents of that religion <laughs> and not its enemies. Secondly, don't compare your best to their worst. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, leave room for holy envy. Mm -hmm. And that means be willing to find elements in the other religious tradition and faith that you admire. Mm -hmm. um, we give this lecture in cooperation with Paideia, the European Institute for Jewish Studies in Sweden, and say a special welcome to all the students there. We look forward also to meeting you a bit more later on, but it's great to have you here, as well as Barbara Spector, the head of... There you are, there you are. And um, this year, it's our pleasure and my privilege to introduce Professor Mona Siddiqui from the uh, Edinburgh Divinity School where uh, at the University of Edinburgh, where she is professor in Islamic and interreligious studies. And uh, she's the first person to hold that chair. Uh, and her research areas are primarily in the field of Islamic jurisprudence and ethics and Christian Muslim relations. And uh, in Britain, I think very many people know Mona Siddiqui's name because she is a, a public intellectual and speaker on issues around religion, ethics and public life. That kind of person who media turns to when they want to comment on things happening in the Islamic world. Uh, and she also uh, appears at uh, BBC Radio 4 and BBC Radio Scotland's Thoughts for the Day, the equivalent of our Tankar för dagen in Swedish radio. Uh, and uh, Mona Siddiqui is a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, holds four honorary doctorates. Not yet in Uppsala, do you? No. We'll have to work on that. <laughs> and um, she has also been awarded an OBE, Order of the British Empire, is that is, for her interfaith mm -hmm. services. Oh, so I think, yeah, that's, that's brilliant. <laughs> I think that says something about Mona Siddiqui's uh, achievement, but it also says something about uh, the British society that they would award such, such an order for interfaith services. That's a great thing, I think. And uh, she is uh, also, she has published many books, and uh, this one is brand new, Hospitality and Islam, Welcoming in God's Name. And we have a few copies for sale after the lecture, as well as uh, a very interesting book, uh, Christians, Muslims and Jesus, and uh, so both those are here if you are interested. The format of our lecture will be that first we have the lecture and then a question and answer session followed by a reception with some refreshments outside. So now I give the floor to Mona Siddiqui. <coughs> Thank you, Elena. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. 
Thank you for the clap for the OBE. Thank you also the Diocese of Stockholm and Idea Institute for this honour. I've been here since yesterday. The weather's been lovely and it actually has been a really lovely day. Uh, so the title of this lecture is Love and Law in Christianity and Islam, and um, it is a paper I've written, so I'm going to read it, but of course at the end of it, if there's any questions you want to ask, then feel free to ask, or if there's any clarification you need. The title Love and Law in Christianity and Islam sounds rather broad in its scope, but touches on both my primary research interest in Islamic jurisprudence and the beginnings of my academic journey to Christian theology. I'm not here to talk of human love or law, but to explore how the theological framework of love and law has rightly or wrongly encapsulated the way both Islam and Christianity are perceived. So let me begin with a couple of personal anecdotes which forced me to think about these concepts for a long time. Several years ago, a retired academic and church minister, and this was when I was still at the University of Glasgow, he stood next to me in line for morning coffee in the university's canteen. It was around 8.30 and the canteen was always busy at that time, serving breakfast. And we were both familiar faces at that time of the morning. But on this occasion, he came up to me with his breakfast tray and said with a smile, You know, Mona, I could never convert to being a Muslim. I would miss bacon too much. You don't know what you're missing. And this gentleman, like many people in the West, was aware that Muslims and Jews generally observe the scriptural prohibition on eating pig meat. But he couldn't quite understand why laws of this kind bind humanity to God. Indeed, I think he found it faintly amusing that worship of God could be defined and even reduced to dietary prohibition, especially in relation to such succulent animals like the pig. But even after a brief conversation in which I tried to explain the issue of slaughter requirements in general, and not just the prohibition on pig meats, he couldn't quite accept from his Christian perspective how dietary laws could continue to have any spiritual, meaningful relevance in today's society. In man's relationship with God, there must be more important ethical issues than what one eats. Secondly, during a lecture to a group of Catholic students in Rome two years ago, I was asked by a young nun how do you Muslims know God loves you? <laughs> I asked her how she knew God loved her. <laughs> to which she replied, Jesus died for me. That is how I know God loves me. His only son died for my sins. This young nun spoke with such conviction about her own beliefs and seemed to be genuinely puzzled as to how could Muslims understand God's love when there is no distinctive event to reflect this love. For her, neither scripture nor prophecy were enough. It was what God had done to himself, his movement to show love for his creation which mattered. And this conversation has been one of several where I've understood that many Christians understand the concept of divine love not as a difference between Islam and Christianity, but perhaps as the central difference. Not only is this often understood by clustering Islam and Judaism together, usually against Christianity as religions of the law, more concerned with right practice than right doctrine. But this approach is further confirmed by acknowledging that whilst Judaism, Christianity and Islam are monotheistic traditions which speak of God's love, it is Christianity alone which speaks of God's unconditional love. The argument is that in Islam and Judaism, the kind of love which is manifested through the fulfillment of precepts and submission to God's will, or nomos, by its very nature, speaks of a bilateral co commitment between man and God. In these two religions, despite the plurality of words, which command an affinity between God and his creation, there seems to be no defining moment when God seals his love for humankind. During my many years of teaching Islamic studies to undergraduates, I've often used comparisons between Christian theology and Islamic thought as a way of inviting students to think of words and their meanings in different theological and <coughs> scriptural contexts. Using the word theology here is itself problematic, but the word theology has, for most of its life, been regarded as a largely Christian discipline in the academy. And this traditional understanding of theology does not neatly translate into a scholarly activity for all world religions, 
including those commonly defined as the monotheistic. In 1976, a Sufi perennialist, Fritjof Schumann, drew attention to this issue in his assessment of the disciplines of theology <coughs> within the Christian and Islamic scholarly tradition, and he wrote, theology does not have and cannot have the same function or the same dignity in Islam as in Christianity. In Christianity, it has majestic prototypes in the Gospel of St. John and the Epistles, followed by venerable models in the writings and fathers of, fathers of the church. But theology in Islam has no sacred prototype. Neither the Quran nor the Sunnah contain any such thing. And the first theological attempts to meet were met with a categorical rejection on the part of the traditionalists. So that in fact the legitimacy of Kalam, or philosophical thinking, remains open or at least not entirely settled. It would consequently be unjust to wish to compare two theologies, the Christian and the Muslim. I think Sean is right to an extent, particularly if one searches for an Islamic theological equivalent to the richly complex Christian doctrines of God. Theology as a discipline doesn't neatly translate from the Christian context to the Islamic. But I understand theology at its simplest level to mean human attempts to talk of God. In doing theology, we are attempting to define and respond to God in some way, because God has spoken. In Islam, prophecy and scripture are inextricably tied to divine communication, so that it's principally through Muhammad and the Quran that Muslims come to see God as a moral and eschatological reality. There is an understanding that throughout history, God sends and humanity receives different forms of God's communication. And it's in this receiving that humankind understands something of a God who both hides and reveals himself. By contrast, scripture and prophecy play a secondary role in Christianity, in the sense that through Jesus Christ, God no longer offers us a prophetic message pointing to an eschatological reality, rather God offers himself. Traditional theistic interpretations of God's omnipotence do not place any obligations on either God's essence or his attributes, but God chooses to reveal. So why is there revelation in the first place? For the Muslim mystics, such as Ibn Arabi, the central ontological question, why there is anything rather than nothing, was made explicit in the famous hadith, I was a hidden treasure, then I desired to be known. So I created a creation to which I made myself known and then they knew me. The very purpose of creation is for God to reveal himself. <clears throat> but even now, this is not because God needs creation <clears throat> in any way to realize his fullness, but because God's creative love is so strong that it triggers off the whole process of creation. God's self-identity is timeless. He does not become less God or more God in the act of creation, but something within him inspires a movement of creative freedom. And there is a privilege to this relationship, expressed most poignantly, where God himself is said to have said, man is my secret and I am his. The tension between self-revelation and complete transcendence has exercised the minds of Christian and Muslim scholars for centuries. How to reconcile a God who is radically one and transcendent and a God who reveals for a purpose? In both religions, God reveals in diverse ways in history so that we can recenter ourselves to, to him. As Rowan Williams says, God is a presence to which all reality is present. In developing this relationship between the divine and the human, Muslims focused on God's modes and purpose in revelation, the human obligation to submit to reading God's presence in the Quran, and understanding the obeying God's will in response to a revealed text. Christianity saw in Revelation an aspect of God's self-giving and the centrality of love in Christ. To this, Karl Barth said, God is he who in his revelation seeks and creates fellowship with us. He does not will to be God for himself, nor is God to be alone with himself. In both faiths, Revelation is essentially about divine disclosure of a creative desire or love. But these phenomena are located and expressed in different ways. Against this background, the manner of God's love has been expressed in various ways within monotheism. 
in biblical and post-biblical Judaism, love is a principal axis in the relationship between God and Israel. God's specific love for the people of Israel is described in the prophetic book of Hosea. In the Song of Songs, God is depicted as a, love, a husband or a lover, not as a father. In Isaiah, God says, O Israel, fear not, for I will redeem you, and I love you. For some, the core commandment of Judaism is, Levitic is Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself. Others have stressed various passages in Deuteronomy, which served as the most significant sources for many later authorities. And the German Jewish philosopher Franz Rosenzweig argues that this commandment to love the neighbor arises out of the unique love God has for the children of Israel. And the centrality of this love is reflected most poignantly in the Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord is your God. However, Rosenzweig also finds it remarkable that throughout the Torah, God demands that Israel loves him, but never professes love for Israel, except in a future sense. That is, if Israel loves God, he will bless them in return. Love for God is expressed through carrying out the commandments. But in Jewish Midrash, it is said that the believer loves that which comes from God, and that is why he studies the Torah. In Islam, the doctrine of God began and ended with an affirmation of God's absolute and complete unity. It was rather the dilemma of obedience to God, not so much in worship, but in the whole range of human activity that has proved to be the central theological activity of Muslim scholars in the classical period, and which we call jurisprudence. With no clerical hierarchy in Sunni Islam, with no central focus of authority, classical scholars set the parameters of discourse both defining and redefining the detail, exercising juristic artistry, as well as faithful devotion. As Norman Porter wrote, revelation can never be perceived directly as an act of God, irrespective of the degree of metaphor described in the notion that God writes himself. It is the writings of God's mediators that are available for analysis. Not even of the Quran is it claimed that God dictated and merely dictated it. The, problem, the problematics of love and law lie primarily in the fact that in both Islam and Judaism, the outsider sees law largely through a prism of ritualism in opposition to the ethical. Law is the external, the public, and the ceremonial, whereas true spiritualism, or morality, is to be found in the internal, the unstructured, the emotional, and the personal. In comparing Muslim and Christian views on scripture and law, Zidane writes, the Christian view of scripture as law is more complex than the Islamic one because it's tempered by the doctrine of salvation by faith rather than by obedience to a written law. The complexity of love and law in relation to grace finds a particular tension in the letters of Paul. Perhaps no other topic in Pauline studies has aroused more discussion and frustration than that of Paul and the law. But if this subject is important within Pauline studies, it is also the most difficult. The problem arises from the differing and seemingly contradictory statements that Paul makes about the law and the function of the law in relation to sin. Paul's dilemma on the law and sin reaches a particular complexity in his letters to the Romans. And in Romans 7, when he says, what then shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For the purpose of this talk, I, I realize how complex this area is, but I'm going to be brief. <laughs> Paul refers to human enslavement to sin, and that even when humankind tries to do moral good by observing the law, people cannot master their passions and desires, and end up doing what they don't want to do. It is sin that brings alienation from creation because it's sin that brings alienation from God. The law cannot rescue humankind. Paul expresses a highly paradoxical account of Christian experience. As a faithful Jew, he recognized the law as a blessing from God. But as a Christian, he also realized that the law taught what sin is. He is at the same time confident of redemption through Christ, but also continues to be aware of the power of sin within him. By, observing, by failing to observe the law. 
Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. With my mind I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh I am a slave to the law of sin. It's not entirely clear how this paradox is resolved. The sin is inherent in humankind. It's a barrier to fellowship with God. For Paul, it's in the presence of grace and eternal love, as personified in Jesus, where redemption lies. Galatians 3.24 the law was our guardian until the Messiah came, so we might be justified by faith. Herein lies a fundamental difference between Christianity and Islam, in that the very nature of sin means that guidance alone can never redeem or restore that which we have lost. Sin is not a human act, but a human condition, in which people are weak and need grace. If prophecy is not enough, neither is guidance scriptural or otherwise. It is divine grace which must be seen to be active in human life which redeems. <clears throat> From the Muslim perspective, guidance and grace work together not to transform our sinful condition, but to lead us to God. Although Islamic thought does not have the equivalence of the complex Christian doctrinal debates, such as the Incarnation, Trinity and Resurrection, it has an inner story of God which I think has been lost to some extent in the modern preoccupation with simplifying prescriptive obedience through the generalized and misused notion of Sharia. If theology at its simplest level is fundamentally human attempts to understand God, then the various intellectual disciplines of Islam, speculative theology, kalam, philosophy, philosopher, jurisprudence, fiqh, and mysticism, the salaf, is therefore all examples of understanding the relationship of human beings to God. They are all ways of reflecting upon God. The intellectual response to God is no less than worship itself, because belief in God demands an obligation to talk of God. Silence, <coughs> even contemplative silence, is not enough. I'm reminded here of the last part of Socrates' faith and the comparison between a painting and the written word both of which talk to us while maintaining a majestic silence. It is up to the exegetes to give voice to this majestic silence. Christianity and Islam have their distinct interpretive traditions, but the reception of the divine word is different for both. In Christianity, scripture is secondary to the event of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. The incarnation is a mystery of the divine taking on human form, and thus becoming the essential structure at the very core of a Christian understanding of God. Jesus' role is salvific, whereas Muhammad's role is prophetic. The structure and manifestation of God's love in Christianity is fundamentally different from that in Islam. As for scripture itself, the biblical <coughs> narrative of God's love is dramatic and not just poetic. When one looks for similar verses of God's love for humanity and his creation in the Quran, they can appear quite different even timid in comparison with their biblical counterpart, such as a love narrative in John's Gospel. When one reads the Quranic verses which explicit, explicitly mention God's love, the expression of this love is varied, situational, even logical to the human mind. But it is only one Quranic motif amongst many others. The root habba and its derivatives best reflect the various dimensions of what God loves and what he does not love. So for example, God loves those who keep themselves pure. Do good, for God loves those who do good. Do not transgress limits, for God does not love the transgressors. <coughs> Maybe the most surprising thing is that in the Quran, there is no commandment <coughs> to love God like the gospel commandment in Mark 12, 30. And yet, it was these same Quranic verses which inspired the exuberance of love theme in Sufi literature. In Islamic thought, other than in Sufi literature, the love rhetoric has been virtually eclipsed by the rhetoric of obedience, as the discussion around law gradually took preeminence in Islam's intellectual heritage, even amongst its popular piety. Even amongst the Sufis, systematic theories of divine love did not develop in early Muslim mysticism. There are few works which provide a complete theory of divine love but it's still through the rich and wide prism of Sufi poetry where the theme of God's cosmic love has been most poignantly felt. 
The Sufis kept a distinction between how God loves man and how man loves God. Love in its various manifestations is part of the world order, the cosmic order. But there is no particular word which defines a relationship of love between God and man, so that the concept of love carries within it the sense of both the divine and the profane. The challenge of the Sufis was to how to define God's love, but also whether love, which implies a need amongst human beings, can itself be attributed to a perfect God who has no need. Furthermore, not all Sufis agreed with the conventional dichotomies posed by the distinction between ishqa haqiqi, love directed to God, and ishqa majazi, love directed to human beings. In different ways in the Quran, the emphasis on human worship of God remains a principle, if not the only explanation, as to why human beings were created. Ibn Arabi, however, drew a connection between love and worship, so that worship of God was not about knowing God or obedience to him, but essentially about loving God. For Ibn Arabi, love becomes a universal principle, encompassing the actions of all creation, the basis by which all phenomena are explicable. Human beings may not be able to attribute a beginning or purpose to God's love, but he writes, we came from love, and we are created in love. Inspired by the Quranic vocabulary of love and mercy, as well as the divine names of God, many Sufis saw the whole of the cosmos as pulsating with the love which flows from God and the ecstasy of desiring God. I'm just going to read a few lines of, from Rumi. You infused my being through and through, as an intimate friend must always do. So when I speak, I speak of only you, and when silent, I yearn for you. The voice of love each moment comes from everywhere we were in heaven once. We were friends to angels once. To that place let us return. That is our country, our home. Higher than heavens we are. Greater than angels we are. Why not leave them both behind? Our goal is majesty divine. And perhaps Rumi's most famous lines. However must I describe love's qualities? When I am in it, my words aren't adequate. The tongue can throw some light on it. But love is most illumined by silence. When the pen was busy writing, it was fluent. When it reached the word of love, it broke down. It seems to me that if the pen broke when it reached the word of love, that it may be even more difficult, if not impossible, to define the extent of God's love based on the usage of loving terms in the Quran. When the Quran tells us that it contains that which is hidden and which remains with God. The Quranic God is intimately but not openly tied to the life of his creation. God retains the elements of secrecy of self by speaking only through inspiration or from behind a veil, never revealing himself directly to humankind. The secrecy motif is presented throughout the Quran in various ways. God hides and reveals. God knows the secret of our hearts, but human beings do not know the secrets of God. To God belong all that is in the heavens and the earth, whether you know what is in yourselves or conceal it, God will call you to account for it. He knows your secret and your disclosure. But this did not preclude Muslims from understanding the Quran as saying something about God and viewing the Quran as a glimpse into God's being and mercy. The love vocabulary complements that which lies at the core of divine engagement with creation. The fundamental term which allows us a glimpse of God's nature is in the principle of mercy, or loving compassion, rahmah. The Quran is complete with the vocabulary of compassion as a defining essence of God. <coughs> this overwhelming mercy is a mystery, for it is essentially a plea from God not to ever despair of God's mercy. Mercy, unlike love, is not bilateral. We cannot have mercy on, him, on God. But God chooses and de desires to be merciful to human beings. There are many traditions where believers have implored God to keep them away from sin. And God's response is, all my believing servants ask this from me. But if I should keep you all away from sin, upon whom will I bestow my blessings? And to whom will I grant forgiveness? <laughs> 
Despite the charge often leveled at the Quranic God that he loves conditionally, most Muslim theologians and Sufis did not see conditionality in this relationship. The foremost theologian of the Islamic world, Al-Ghazali, considers both love and law to be central tenets of Islam and being a Muslim. He doesn't see any conditionality in the prior fulfillment of the law, but rather sees observance of the law as a sublime way to show love for God. He describes the mystical states and stations towards God by concluding that the love of God is the highest in rank and the last stage in drawing towards God before repentance and patience. Love is not a means to God, it is the end station, for the acquisition of the love of God is the end. Al-Ghazali is quite clear that love of God means something more than mere obedience, while equally insisting that Muslims must be obedient. The intimacy of law, he writes, in relation to, in relationship to God, is such that Muhammad is presented as saying, worship has ten parts, nine of those are seeking the lawful. It is possible to say that seeking knowledge of the lawful and the unlawful is considered by most Muslim theologians to be not only a form of worship, but perhaps the most important aspect of worship, even though the Islamic tradition is full of examples which emphasize divine love over divine obedience. A desert Arab asks the Prophet that he had not prepared for the day of judgment. He hadn't prayed or fasted or done any good deeds, but he did love God and the Prophet. The Prophet replies, he who loves one will be with him. And it is said that love of God, even to the measure of mustard seed, is dearer to me than divine service for 70 years without love. The law to which Al-Bazali refers is a complex issue. Right to belief is a path to salvation, and this is contained not just in creedal formulae, but in the vast corpus of writings on correct behavior. The technical Muslim word which is used to convey the sense of practical faith as ordained by God is Sharia, commonly but misleadingly translated into English as Islamic law. Law implies a set, a set of rules, a set of precepts, imposed upon society, and Sharia is not a superimposed structure on society. It designates religion in its totality, not just duties which man must perform in obedience. Sharia is then fixed divine legislation, is not fixed legislation by God, but rather a process of uncovering ethical <coughs> behavior. Sharia is seen by some as normative ethics, but it is fundamentally an ideal. It is God's law within the science of jurisprudence, which, which the science of jurisprudence must endeavor to uncover and relate for the spiritual benefits of the faithful. The jury's perception of the written law is that it's a reflection of his faith, a vehicle for conveying moral and material standards within the framework of faith. But going against the law is part of being human. When the Muslim tradition speaks of divine forgiveness, it recognizes the inevitability of human wrongdoing. And there is a tradition here, which I think sums it up. According to the tradition, when the servant commits a sin and asks God for pardon, God says to the angels, look at my servant, he has committed a sin, and he knows that he has a Lord who will pardon and take away the sin. I testify to you that I have pardoned him. And according to the tradition, if my servant were to sin so that his sins were to reach the clouds of the skies, I would pardon him, insofar as he asked pardon of me. The law narrative has often played out against the love narrative, but the two should not be seen as opposing paradigms. But love and law continue to conceptualize both faiths, and often in rather simplistic terms. Namely, that Christianity is predominantly a religion of love, through its understanding of Jesus Christ, whereas Islam is a religion of law through its understanding of the Quran. And this has been amplified through generations by many Christians. In his own deliberation on dialogue with Islam, Hans Kung wrote, the portrait of Jesus in the Quran is all too one-sided, too monotone, and for the most part lacking in content, apart from monotheism, the court of repentance and various accounts of miracles. At any rate, it's very different from the portrait of Jesus in history, who not only confirms the law as the Quran records, 
but rather counters all legalism with radical love, which even extends to his enemies. That is why he was executed, though the Quran fails to recognize this. But to appreciate this love and law dialectic, I think we have to understand the prior story, namely the overlapping concept, concepts of how evil and sin entered the world. Gustav Grunbaum expresses this succinctly when he writes, that evil is a point where the perpetual contradictions of our existence intersect. Our knowledge that we are free, our knowledge that we are not, our knowledge that we are masters and creators, and our knowledge that we are frail and transitory beings, feeble, multiply conditioned, and that our works along with ourselves are condemned to bear the stigma of futility. One of the major challenges for Christian theologians has been to understand evil not just in terms of the Augustinian notion of the fall and redemptive salvation, but in the earthly and metaphysical dilemma posed by the relationship between an all-knowing benevolent God with conditioned or unconditioned omnipotence and human freedom to resist God's goodness. For Augustine, the curses of sin and death are the consequences of sex and sexual desire. Adam and Eve's fall resulted in a basic disorder between the flesh and spirit. But he tried to exonerate God from any blame by attributing evil to the choices of human will. For Augustine, the moral life finds its meaning in the interpretive interpretation of God as love. In the Irenaean type of theodicy, humankind does not emerge as a finitely perfect, but as an immature being who needed to develop and mature within the challenges of the world. In the two-stage process of human development, mankind isn't born perfect, but rather perfection lies in the future. To grow into that perfect being while exercising genuine freedom requires a certain distance from God in a world where God is not overwhelmingly evident, but where humankind has the freedom to grow, to know. Islamic theology, both classical and modern, has been less occupied with this subject, as it could be argued that for the most part, most Sunni theologians generally denied that humans have the freedom to act. Furthermore, while free will was understood as a necessary corollary for the power to choose good, and for some reflected ultimately on a God who is good, it is very difficult to be exact about any ontological definition of a word like evil in Islam. The variety of words in the Quran and native Islamic tradition to encompass a sense of human wrongdoing and human erring do not in themselves contain anything similar to the depth of differing but related views of terrible human action and terrible human suffering which have occupied the minds of Christian and Western theologians and philosophers. With the exception of a few medieval thinkers, the issue of evil was not approached directly, but rather subsumed within the larger discussions around the unity of God and the goodness of God. Max Weber, I think, is right to say that Islam lacks the sense of tragic which comes from the feeling of sin. This theme is reflected in the writings of 20th century Christian missionaries who travel to Muslim lands. The Dutch reformed missiologist Heinrich Kramer identified a common perception amongst many Christians and also extolled by some Muslims that Islam is a simple religion in which submission to God's will and majesty encapsulates the very heart of the faith. Of course, he didn't mean it as a compliment. Islam may be called a religion that has almost no questions and no answers. In a certain respect, its greatness lies there, because this questionless and answerless condition is a consistent exemplification of its deeper spirit expressed in its name, Islam, that is, absolute surrender to God. But whereas Muslims rightly or wrongly see virtue in the simplicity, Kramer saw it it saw in its superficiality. He identified two main reasons behind the superficiality. Firstly, there is a mechanical idea of revelation in Islam, a rigid form which has become externalized and fossilized. And this is in opposition to biblical realism and God who constantly acts in holy sovereign freedom, conclu conclusively embodied in the man of Jesus Christ. Kramer's second point is that the superficiality of Islam lies in its clumsy external conception of sin and salvation. 
denying that there is any anthropology in Islam. He's amazed that Islam, despite having its historical roots in the Bible, there is nothing of the stirring problems of God and man that are involved in the terms of sin and salvation. So why did Kramer think this? The Christian story of the fall has its parallel in the fall of Iblis in Islam. In the Quran, Adam's first act of freedom is also his first, first act of disobedience. But despite Adam's actions, the Quranic story focuses on divine forgiveness of this disobedience and the transition of man to earth. Not as a punishment, but because humankind was always destined for the earth. It was here that man would find his true role. In fact, the Indian philosopher Muhammad Iqbal commented, Adam's transgression was not a loss, not an act of moral depravity. It is man's simple transition from consciousness to the first flash of self-consciousness, a kind of waking from the dream of nature. In Iqbal's view, it is not that God desires to keep humankind from becoming more aware, but Adam's inherent impulse is to reach out for autonomous experience and knowledge. His sin is that of being too inquisitive. For Iqbal, good and evil fall within the same whole of creation because both are predicated on God's taking risk, faith in humanity, and human freedom to choose. The philosopher rather than the Sufi Iqbal had faith in man's ego, so much so that for Iqbal, man had an independent capacity for his ultimate salvation. The onus is on man, not God. As Iblis, who is now Satan, expelled from paradise, finds his new destiny on his earth, his future is now intertwined with that of humankind. He vows to whisper tem temptation to humankind with the sole purpose of leading people away from God. But nowhere in the Quran do we know why Iblis was given this reprieve. If he is now the personification of the source of potential and real dog, wrongdoing, rejected by God, his nature and purpose is based on the intent to destroy goodness, beginning with the sexual innocence in Adam and Eve. The awareness he arouses in Adam and Eve is not an increased awareness of the divine, but that of the profane. And again, it's Shuan who encapsulates this. Loving each other, Adam and Eve love God. They could neither love God nor know God. After the fall, they loved each other outside God and for themselves. And they knew each other as separate phenomena and not as theophanies. This new kind of love was concupiscence and this new knowing was profanity. However one understands this narrative, at one level, the Quranic story is essentially a story of struggle, but not alienation from a transcendent God. So faith in God is not an antidote to evil, but faith kept alive can counteract all the passion and tragedy of evil. Evil is not some objective malign force, or as a French social theorist John Baudrillard says, a deliberate perversion of the order of the world. The Quran itself does not give any abstract analysis of tragedy, evil, and human loss, but repeats the theme of human propensity to do wrong, alongside an infinitely good God. And whether some evil is necessary were not questions which occupy the world view of the majority of Muslim thinkers. Why, we, why humans have to suffer natural disasters or be subject to unbearable pain are issues often dissolved rather than resolved within the arguments for an omnipotent God. While much of Islamic thought tried to absolve God of actively creating evil deeds and leading people astray, it recognized that human wrongdoing is part of the divine plan, and that God has a stake in both the good that we do and the wrong that we do. Evil is not a contradiction, but a challenge to human life. In this pursuit, the good life, God's revelation, guides against all forms of wrong, but human conscience has always been vulnerable from the time of Adam. So human suffering and sin are not meant to be wiped out through any divine act, but are intrinsic to the human condition. Human nature is not tainted nor defined by evil. Evil is seen largely through the prism of human choice, <clears throat> rather than divine damnation. <clears throat> so evil is not a state, evil is acts. 
minus the tragic element of sin, as evident in much of Christian theological reflection, even loses its transcendental dimension and can appear to be reduced to the more prosaic, even the banality of human wrongdoing. But Islamic thought, wrongdoing is not banal. It's corrosive, futile for the individual and society, and leads ultimately to an evasion of moral responsibility. It is through the possibility of wrongdoing, repentance, and subsequent discernment that we can hope to attain moral growth. Iblis is a symbolic but necessary player in the human quest for salvation, because without him, there is nothing for intelligence to master. God's revelation as guiding revelation is not the central theme of sin, evil, and salvation in Christian doctrine. Maurice Wiles writes, that the Christian tradition has never believed that men needed only to be shown the truth about God and about human life. Sin has usually been regarded as more fundamental than ignorance. Men need not only be enlightened, they need to be changed. The forgiveness and transformation of man are at least as basic to Christ's mission as the impartation of knowledge and illumination. Sin constitutes the most critical alienation from God it creates a profound rupture in one's relationship with God. In rival Niebuhr's The Nature and Destiny of Man, he writes, the Christian estimate of evil is so serious precisely because it places evil at the very center of human personality, in our will. Sin is occasioned precisely by the fact that man refuses to admit his creatureliness and to acknowledge himself as merely a member of total unity in life. Man pretends to be more than he is. Niebuhr believed that ultimate salvation is not a moral possibility, that the sinful self-contradiction in the human spirit cannot be overcome by moral action. For him, for him human life contains, remains contradictory in its, in its sin, no matter how human culture rises. But the God of Christian faith is not only creator, but redeemer. He does not allow human existence to end tragically. He snatches victory from defeat. He himself is defeated in history, but he is also victorious in that defeat. Divine love is central to Christianity because we cannot reconcile ourselves to God. Only God can reconcile himself to us. In Christianity, God is a God of love. Indeed, God is love. And even though theologians have wrestled with what is meant by God is love. There remains in Christianity a fundamental conviction that neither God nor humanity can be understood outside the multiple expressions of divine love. How God loves humankind has dominated Christian theology. In his classic work, Agape and Eros, Andres Newgrin argued that God's love is a gift prompted by the very nature of God to love. We have therefore every right to say that agape is the center of Christianity. It comes to us as a new creation of Christianity. It sets its mark on everything in Christianity. Without it, nothing that is Christian would be Christian. Agape is Christianity's own original basic conception. While both Islam and Christianity talk of a loving God, Islam relying on the concept of mercy for a more expansive definition of love, in my view, there is a profound structural difference in the way love is conceptualized in both religions. By focusing primarily on its human manifestation in Christ, love in Christianity is a redemptive act and becomes visible on the cross and its power in the paradox of the weakness of the cross. In Christianity, evil is both a structural and an accidental element, whereas in Islam, evil is an accidental element only. Thus, in Christian thought, salvation does not come about through our best efforts. It is not some happy state to which we can lift ourselves. It is an utterly new creation into which we are brought by our death, in Jesus' death, and our resurrection in his. Postmodern philosophers like Zizek, while accusing Christ of wanting our very souls when they say they don't want anything from us, saw in the coming of Christ the descent of the sublime beyond to the everyday level. This doesn't mean that we renounce transcendence completely, but that in him, that transcendent realm becomes accessible as imminent transcendence. 
Christianity is a religion of love, for God does not remain in the sublime beyond. Thomas Althusser also argued that after the incarnation, there is no transcendent God. Christians cannot take the incarnation seriously as long as they combine the doctrine of the incarnation with a belief in a transcendent, sovereign, and an impassive God. And just to conclude, in Islam, however, there is no divine incarnation, and neither is prof prophecy messianic, nor Muhammad the Redeemer. God's love is manifest by the risk he takes in humanity, by giving man both faith and freedom to work toward a moral life. And humanity has then the choice to transform itself to a state of higher consciousness. But humankind is not damned by the impossibility for overcoming sin, because there is no sinless place to which we can enter, only a better place which we can create. What matters is continued belief and hope in God, not the sins we commit. We don't need to be saved from sin, but rather from unbelief. Islam has a different concern. It lifts God back into the transcendent, not in the sense of a distant God, but a God who chooses to retain the secrets of himself. But despite keeping this distance between man and God, the faithful have remained restless to do away with that which separates humankind from God, even in this life. And nowhere has this desire to eradicate the distance between the human and the divine been more hauntingly expressed than in the words of the great Sufi poet, Abdul Abdus, who refers to the Prophet's night's journey to the heavens. Muhammad of Arabia ascended the highest heaven and returned. I swear by God that if I had ever reached that point, I should never have returned. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Siddiqui, for this very interesting and um, very, very deep and um, it arouses many thoughts, at least for me, and I think it's for, that goes for, for all of us. Um, so I'm sure there are a lot of questions and comments on this lecture. Yeah, you can, I can throw up a Svensk on the so can we overshare that? Questions can be raised in Swedish, I just said. As long as you translate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because you've been here for 24 hours now. So like <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're all thoughtful, you know, thinking about this lecture. So, love and law. So I start off while you're, the rest of you are thinking. Uh, I think it's very interesting the way you sort of, uh, I mean, first we have this Christianity is love and Islam is law, and that's very different. And for many, many people would want to sort of resolve that but by, by saying, oh no, but there is love in Islam as well, it's almost the same thing. But I think you really point out what is so, what makes interfaith dialogue so exciting that we can say that Yes, there is love in both religions, but we think about it in different ways. Um, I don't know, do, uh, what do you say about this? How do we go on in interfaith? I mean, you are so knowledgeable. I think you know, have read more Christian theologians than, than most of the Christians in this room. But um, how, how can we uh, get on in interfaith dialogue without sort of collapsing, saying it's the same thing? And, and how, how can we live with these two different conceptions of love? Well, anyone who goes into interfaith dialogue to collapse into anything <laughs> is not going in with the right attitude. <laughs> so um, I don't think that any um, goal of interfaith dialogue is to try and merge concepts together or to try and say that um, we're actually talking about the same thing in different ways. We might be talking about the same things in different ways, but 
if you're doing scholarly inter interfaith dialogue, you have to compare life with life, and you have to have people who have knowledge of their own tradition as well as somebody else's tradition. Yes. And very often that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, to be honest, interfaith dialogue is a Christian initiative, largely, historically, yeah. um, based on what I would call, with all respect, the failure of the missionaries. Mm. <laughs> so, well, but it's true. I mean, it was, it's, it's another way of reaching out. Mm. But it's, it's uh, and so, but most Christians who do interfaith dialogue do it very respectfully because they're wanting to invite people in to converse with them. But when it comes to Christian Muslim, there are far more Christians who know about Islamic thought than there are Muslims who know about Christian culture. So there's always that imbalance. And it depends, I suppose, what you mean by interfaith. If you mean people getting together to just be with one another and have conversations about basic concepts. But if you're talking about at a scholarly level, it's very difficult to have that life for life. Um, and there's simply, even in the years I've been thinking about this and writing about this, I don't see many Muslim academics coming through the system who are interested in Christian theology. And I was thinking the third point of the Dundal three points, the holy envy is probably where I see myself. Things about Christian theology that have made me think about my own faith. Um, but never because I have to prove something, it's just a way of exploring concepts. Mm. Yeah. You have to excuse my bad English. Italian ruined it some years ago. <laughs> um, an old Jesuit master said to his pupil once, they were asking him, they were worried about the rules. They couldn't really follow them always, and he told them like this. Well, God provided you with love and good sense. Could you please use it? Can that be said to a Muslim too? <laughs> That's my question. Um, there are so many, I mean, this is just or, to be honest, this was just a kind of cursory glance at this, but there are so many traditions which do away with all law. You know, so that I think I gave you one example already. Even if you had the slightest bit of love for God, you're going to be saved. Your life is fantastic. I mean, there is a God. Whether you do anything or not, whether you observe any of the laws or not. And I suppose my own wrestling with Islamic, Islam, Muslim societies and Muslim thinkers is, um, that law or the observance or the insistence in obedience has skewed all the other types of engagement. So that it's only about, and it's getting worse, so that it's not only about, for example, doing the ablutions before you pray, but if you haven't done them in a certain way exactly, then they don't count. Now surely I would say God is more concerned about your prayer than whether you've missed a little bit of water or being aware of or something. But this issue about um, law has taken precedence over everything else, has become a feature of many Islamic societies. Um, and as to me as a Muslim, that's quite worrying, because it means that there is no space for anything else, any other ways of thinking about God. Messages together. 
what would you say about that? How would you think? How would you follow all the messages together? Uh, this is the, I think, what God is uh, actually wanting from us. Uh, in the Quran, there is a, a verse that says that we should uh, uphold the Bible. You, uh, all you who believe, you, you don't, you haven't come anywhere until you uphold the Bible, the Torah, and the Quran together. And we will sing to you from God together. So I think this is a, a mission that we have to do. It's not easy, but it has to be done. I suppose it depends what you mean by um, holding them together. Um, this, as I said to you at the beginning, this isn't talking about human love. There should be no distinction. I mean, there doesn't have to be any distinction between the way you love another Muslim as opposed to the way you love somebody of another faith. I'm talking about something that I see structurally different in the way that love, love is conceptualized. And love through evil and sin um, in both Islam. It's just one perspective in Islam and Christianity. But there is a strange contradiction or um, a paradox or a tension, whichever one you choose. Uh, because obviously the Quran, for those apologists who say that Muslims sign up to pluralism, will say the Quran has all these verses that talks about um, and those who believe, and those who do good, and those who are the Jews and the Christians will be saved, or, or will enter paradise. And Jews and Christians are mostly seen as asylum believers. But then, of course, they, what was revealed to them was also corrupted by them. Hmm. So which, which revelation to the Jews and Christians is it that we are supposed to confirm? Bearing in mind, now of course you could say it as a simple human being, we don't have to concern ourselves with that. We can't resolve that tension in the Quran. So if there are more verses and there is a greater ethical framework for being with people of our believers, bear in mind that the traditional ummah of the prophets, the concept of ummah was not Muslim brotherhood. It was brotherhood of all the believers, in which there were Jews and Christians. So much of the Quranic narrative is really between those who believe in God and those who don't. And those who believe in God encompasses everybody at the time who believed in God. It was much later that the fractions and the factions started between believers as Muslims and believers as others. So you've got both a sense of, yes, there is a kind of pluralism there, and you can take that pluralism to mean something very good and very generous and not be concerned about, but you do. I mean, I think most, to be honest, I think most people are, who are interested in any kind of religious activity or dialogue are not, I hope, are not entering into two, two, as again, as point two, to show the best of theirs and the worst of theirs. <laughs> because that's not dialogue. Why are you doing this? Um, and it's not even about um, not talking about difficult issues. Because if you're confident in your faith, you should be allowed, you should be able to talk about difficult issues. And, not, and also have the courage to say, I can't figure that one out. Um, but I still live with that. Because most of us don't figure everything out in our faith, but we live with it. Um, I, I, at a human level, I don't see any difference. I'm just talking about a structural level as to why, when there is very little about um, the love theme in the Quran, how did Sufis and other writers extract so much <coughs> of the love principle? Um, and I suppose it's in reaction to a question I get time and time again that Islam is a religion of law like Ju Judaism, and that we're more concerned with right practice than right belief. And it's tedious to constantly say, actually, no, right belief also matters. It's not just about right practice. <laughs> yes. um, you know, when people say, well, you've, why, why don't you drink, or why don't you eat bacon, or why don't you eat? That's not the sum of my faith. Yeah. That's just a ritual. Um, that's an observance. If I started eating bacon tomorrow and drinking tomorrow, mm. does that mean everything that I believe will also just amount to nothing. I don't think that's what Islam is about. But it's, but that's the kind of rhetoric that is very prevalent. I have a question concerning the term or the phenomenon of tradition. Mm -hmm. In Christianity, tradition is a very important part of revelation. And uh, uh, tradition is to keep something alive which is coming from long ago, but also having to be uh, 
interpreted and um, seen in the light of today and here and now. Otherwise, this tradition would be dead. And uh, sometimes uh, you hear that in Islam, the interpretative activities stopped around uh, the early Middle Ages, as we call it here in Europe, 12th century or 13th century. Um, I would like to ask you um, if this is true and why that is, and if today there are some signs of a new vitalization of interpretation within Islamic tradition. No, absolutely. Absolutely there are. I mean, the majority of these scholars are actually scholars who live in the West. Um, but the, the, the fact that this, this idea that interpretation stopped in the 12th century is just a fallacy. I mean, if you look at the Ottoman records of how people continue to interpret and reinterpret things according to <coughs> new societies, new powers, new concepts, you'll find that law itself changed according to society. Uh, but you'd have to do scholarly work to see that. Um, but I think that the majority of people who are writing about um, new ways of thinking, let's just, just step back for two seconds. In some ways, what you're seeing now is um, the kind of two issues. First of all, that really post-colonialism, uh, Muslims have never been a minority. They've always been a majority. And colonialism came to much of the Muslim world, not the way it did, um, sorry, enlightenment came to the Muslim world, or post-enlightenment structures, through colonialism, not through modernity. So the West was kind of ready, it grew organically, but it didn't grow organically in the Islamic world. And what you have in, in, there's almost two ways of thinking about this. Those who say we have to go back to whatever was part of Islamic golden age. But a lot of scholars who realize that there is no golden age, there is no return to the past. And that actually what we now have to rethink is how do Muslims live as a minority? Because all their laws, all their thinking was based on them being majority or in power. And so, and, and you know, when you look at some of the extremist groups, one of their banners is always Islam will dominate, Islam will become a world, but they can't, that's the way they lure people in. That how can you live as subjugated minorities, because of course the majority of people who are living in the West don't feel they're subjugated minorities, they feel they have all the freedoms to be Western and Muslim. But it's a very powerful call to those who are thinking, yes, maybe one day we will become powerful again, if we... Um, so that shift, and so really post in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, when Muslims started migrating, is really the first time when you have Muslim communities en masse leaving the land of Islam, to put it in such terms, to go to the land of the non-believer. And many people still see, conceptually, the land of Islam as a land of the unbeliever. Whereas now you're hearing more and more voices saying, no, the land of the unbeliever is our home. It is not the land of the unbeliever. And you're hearing these voices, but of course they're usually drowned out by other kinds of voices, mm. which have more of a popular appeal. And I've heard a lot of people are writing law for minority, Muslims as minorities. What does it mean to be a Muslim as a minority? Um, what does citizenship mean? What does loyalty mean? You know, things like nation states, we think we've all grown up with nation states, are very modern concepts. And so for most religious traditions, Christianity included, faith is not determined by nation states. You are a brotherhood globally. And again, that plays into the hands of um, Muslim extremists who say that we are not defined by our nationalities or citizenship. We are defined by a global sense of brotherhood. But of course, that global brotherhood is just an abstract. All of us are defined by nation states and citizenship. So it's quite complicated, but there is new thinking. And a lot of the new thinking is actually by Muslim scholars in the West. I know that you're friends with our Archbishop Antti Jacqueline and uh, when she, in the election process, I'm sure you know, she got the question, uh, who gives the best image of God, uh, Jesus or Muhammad? And um, being an intellectual, she, she wouldn't say yes or no, but tried to say that you put the question wrongly and I think you gave us a clue that maybe not everyone is aware of when you said 
that they have different roles, that Jesus has a salvific role and Muhammad the, the, the prophetic role. Could you say something more about how would you react to that question that she, she got? <laughs> she didn't answer, I'm not answering it. <laughs> She's an archbishop. Um, no, I, 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 I mean, I, I don't think answering or trying to attempt these polarizing questions does anyone any good, because the question is wrong. Uh, you know, but you, for, for mo most Christians, you, you can't compare Jesus with anyone else. There is no comparison. Um, but again, you know, from the Muslim perspective, a lot of Muslims will say that, you know, the Quran mentions all of God's prophets. We revere all of God's prophets, which is true in theory, of course. For them, Muhammad is the ultimate seal. And so therefore, although they, although they would mention all of God's prophets, including Jesus, you know, for most Christians, calling Jesus a prophet is an insult. He's not a prophet. He's far more than a prophet. Um, and so when people come into dialogue and say, yes, but we revere your prophet, well, you're not actually answering the question or you're looking at the issue, which is that he's far, he's left the whole prophetic world. He's gone beyond the prophetic world. So I think the question has to be um, one that appeals to both, something that appeals to how both the Christian understands the difference and how the Muslim understands the difference. I don't think you, it's like preparing cheese and chop. That's beyond the media. Um, I was just thinking about this, well, opposites as it's um, kind of, what is it, the tradition or whatever to see in Christianity with love and law. I mean, that Jesus came and he brought love and, you know, in opposite to, to the law. I mean, that's a, a good, uh, naive and kind of vulgar thing. But, but anyway, I think it's, it's stuck in a way in Christianity. and. Um, I mean, it's, it's quite strange that we, as Lutherans, see the law as something negative because <laughs> <laughs> we are very, you know, law abiding uh, people or something. I think we should generalize. But, Swedish Lutherans, um, Swedish Lutherans, yeah, and Norwegian maybe, and uh, Finnish. <laughs> um, but, um, you say your national prejudice is coming out. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's right. Let's, 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 you know, air them here. <laughs> um, but, um, and I was also thinking about the, the concept of law that scares many people is the concept of Sharia. And you mentioned it. Um, could you get more, I mean, that's, that's really a, 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 kind of like a, a swear word, you know, it's a dirty word for, for some people. Could you get a little more into this, how, how you view the Sharia law? Yeah, just, just to go back to your first point about it. I don't believe for one minute that love came through Jesus Christ to abolish the law. <laughs> but I think it's an image that's stuck. Um, and because law has been reduced to just things that you do to get God's love. Um, but I think um, Sharia originally means a trodden path. It just means a path you tread on to get to the right point. So in Arabic, um, both in Christian, for the Christians of the Middle East as well as the Muslims, Sharia just meant the Sharia of Moses, the Sharia of Jesus, the trodden path of these people. And it was much later that Sharia came to encapsulate just Islamic uh, notions of. But what, we, what we've got is this problem that people forget that Sharia is the whole of your existence. So, the, so it's not just capital punishments which people are seen to associate with. It's the way you pray, what you eat, how you are with your neighbors. Um, the way you cook, the way you entertain hospitality, and all the rest of it. So your whole life is bound in Sharia. So when people say, we don't want Sharia in the West, they've already got Sharia. Muslims marry according to Sharia. They divorce according to Sharia. If they're not eating halal meat, that's Sharia. But what we see in Sharia now is only stoning with ultras and all the rest of it. Somebody actually told me a joke. They said, you know, you Muslims, you continue to stone people after adultery. I said, yeah, but you Westerners, you're stoned before that truth. <laughs> so, and they, they you know, quite get it. And I said, no, it's not a joke. It's the fact that you see Sharia simply as something that most Muslim states use to keep the population controlled. If you look at states like Pakistan, etc., there is no, technically speaking, no blasphemy law. But they use it to keep the population and the minorities in control, especially the Christian minorities. 
Um, so it's a kind of spectre in which Muslims themselves are afraid of, because when the state uses Sharia, it uses it in its very draconian form. Um, and actually, Sharia for most Muslims is just the way they kind of live their lives. Um, it has become reduced only to the punishment laws, which themselves, if you look at classical Islamic law and the way Muslims have Jews have argued, makes it almost, I would say, 99.9% .9 impossible to implement any punishment because the requirement for evidence is so stringent to become almost, almost impossible. So when we have the young man being beaten for um, the, what was his name, Raif, I don't know that. Yeah, you know, there's no reason for that to happen, but that's again the state imposing its view of what it says is Sharia. Um, I think, and just touching on what you were asking, in a way what has happened is that I think most people realize that Sharia was never meant to be a tool in the hand of the state. It was meant to be an ongoing ethical discussion amongst jurists for the welfare of society. As soon as it became a tool in the hand of the state, it kind of lost its juristic legitimacy but became something that the state could use. And that's really, in a way, where the interpretation of it ended and came to be just reduced. So, thank you. Um, I, I think a lot about the, um, the um, way of dealing with dialogue or not to dialogue on more grassroots level. <coughs> And I think the climate has been much harder the last few years. And we meet Christians, not really meet them, we see them in social media and so on, that are, are very, push it very much harder and they know a lot about Islam, mm -hmm. Christians, which is not true, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, does that influence the academical level as well? The harder, the more hard, climate that we see on more grassroots level? Or is the academic level free from things like that? It can't be free. Um, I mean, I sometimes think that, you know, going back to some of the Christian theologians who were fighting against the Nazi pressure, they, you know, they wanted to be scholars and theologians in their own rights. But they had an ethical imperative to engage with politics at the time. And for that, many of them paid a heavy price. Um, but as I was saying to you yesterday, a colleague of mine, a Christian, young Christian theologian who's just joined me from America, who is an Islamicist as well as being a Christian theologian, he said to me, are you eating with the Archbishop tomorrow night? Is this the same Archbishop who's planning a mosque in a church? <laughs> All my American evangelical friends are posting that. So, I did not. I no, I don't, I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying that across the pond, people are hearing and thinking and making up. And of course, there was a lot of work that's been done post 9-11, um, Christian attitudes to Islam, the kind of fear of Islam, the Islamization of Europe, the Islamization of the states. But you can't really turn a blind eye to this because social media prompts you to think and rethink things. And so it's not necessarily, oh, well, I can just ignore it. Irrespective of whether you had done it or not done it, the fact is that people will, people will vent their fears on social media and leave, and that itself will provoke discussion. Um, I think when we're talking about politics and ethics and theology, we can't remain mean to all this. I mean, if you think about the refugee crisis, and the Church of Scotland is bending over backwards to hold seminars and conferences, about what is the Christian response to refugees. So it's a political issue that has come literally on our shores and is provoking. Now, if you turn a blind eye to it so that scholarly work doesn't have to deal with that, then what is theology about? Uh, we can talk about God <coughs> infinitum. It's what we do with one another that matters. So I think that um, I don't think you can stay away from it, actually. And I think if you do, then you're kind of allowing something very negative to do on both sides, whether it's Muslim extremists or fundamentalists on any side. And monotheist religions all have their fundamentalists. They all have their extremists. Um, what you do about it is you still carry on engaging with the conversation. Because if you don't, 
then who else will? Mm. Um, and then people complain that so and so is speaking on my behalf on my faith. Well, then speak up. Well, in, uh, maybe one more question. Then we'll have to finish this, I'm afraid. I have a more general question concerning the interfaith dialogue. Uh, I have very often heard people uh, using parallels between different religions, so calling like um, Quran is like the Torah, and the Torah is like the New Testament, or uh, Imam is like a rabbi, rabbi is like a priest. And uh, I feel that to some extent it is true, but it also, I think, gives a wrong message very often. And so I would like to ask you, like, how do you mitigate with, with this problem? And um, because probably most of us are not Muslims here, uh, could you tell us maybe two or three things that maybe are misunderstood by the parallels mm -hmm. that we should understand maybe yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. Um, the Quran is not like the Quran for Muslims, I suppose, is like what Christ is to Christians. If you understand what the word of God means. Um, and I think also um, when people say, but you know, why don't you why don't why aren't you worried about Muslim leadership in mosques? I've got bigger things to worry about. And partly because um, there is no sense of priesthood and female clerics and the, and the, in the issues that the Christian church is now fighting within itself about what to do with female bishops or female priests, etc. There is no equivalence. So for me, the end, there is only one word that really matters, is justice. So it doesn't matter if the structures are not parallel, are people getting the justice that they deserve, and whether it's male or female. Um, and it, I think it is wrong to say, well, the imam is just like the priest, because the imam's function is very different, at least in Sunni Islam, to the priest. Um, the mosque is just like the church. Again, it's very different in some ways. They're places of worship, but they also are different ways of thinking. I mean, a church is consecrated space. I wouldn't necessarily say a mosque is a consecrated space, <coughs> partly because Muslims can pray anywhere. Um, but it becomes a defined structure. When <coughs> I think for general interfaith dialogue, I don't think it matters too much. I think if you want to go deeper into how that actually affects people. Because a lot of what's happening in dialogue is Muslims who've lived in the West and they're using Western terms to try and explain their own terminology. And sometimes the terms just don't translate. So it's best just to ask, what does this mean in your, rather than, you know, church is the same as a mosque, and imam is the same as a priest. Um, because they are different. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, uh, thank you so much. We know that you have a very, very heavy and busy schedule. You're leaving very early uh, in the morning to go to Peel to give another lecture. So we are pleased that you uh, took your time to come share with us. And we would like to give, give you a little token, a little, just a little, um, to commemorate, to remember this um, occasion here. Um, and it's a, a Norwegian artist and a Pakistani artist who made a CD, um, interpretations of um, a holy text from the Christian and Islamic tradition with songs. And this is also a way of uh, dialogue. And we hope that you will enjoy this form of dialogue too. Thank you. Thank you. And we have the book